the, the technical difficulty, but I'm glad to be back. So you're right, we're, on a, we're in a, a metal building and that may be part of our problem today, but hopefully uh, we'll stay connected. So what I was talking about was, was the, the daily training and, and I don't know exactly where we lost, but you know, if you can get these goats to, uh, uh, to release their head and to give you the, the uh, control over their head, typically we can get the rest of it to follow. And you know, so what we did was we started with either a halter or a chain just getting those goats used to to being uh, to having something pulling against their jaw and to, to get them to give the head. So we'd put a chain on them and we would snap them to the fence and, and make them stand with their head up just a little bit. We'd put a five gallon bucket beside the goat, sit right there with that goat and just, just start uh, settling them down and getting them used to that kind of, of uh, treatment so that they get comfortable with the chain or with the halter being on them. They get comfortable with their head being up at a little more of a an upright position than is normal for them. And they also get get used to you as the showman. So we would do that with those goats for, uh, you know, 20, 30 minutes at a time starting out. And the, the key there is that having that five gallon bucket or a stool or something where you're there with them. You never ever walk off and leave one when they're, when they're snapped to the fence or when they're restrained in, in any sort of a, a manner because they, you know, they'll get nervous. They're gonna be more comfortable with the showman staying right there with them. That's what creates the bond between showman and animals. So it's very critical, very critical that you do that. It's also critical that you don't immediately start trying to walk them. You know, you've got to get them used to having their head uh, up and, and getting used to you having a hold of either the chain or the halter, whichever one you choose to use, they both work well. But you've got to get them used to that before you start teaching them to walk, okay? so. You, you, you've got, that's gonna take some time. This is not first day home kind of an activity that you're gonna have them out there walking and setting up and showing. It's gonna take you uh, several days, probably a period of a few weeks to get them to the point that they really feel comfortable walking for you. And, you know, goats have a short memory. So you can't go work with them one day, wait 10 days and go try again. You're starting over. It's a daily kind of an activity where you're, you're building that, uh, that knowledge and that comfort in those goats, getting them where they'll work for you and do what you need them to do. So that's what we did to, to get them started. We'd do that in the pen. We would snap them to the fence, uh, settle them down and work in the pen before we ever took them out and started getting them to walk. It's really nice if you have the, the luxury of having a leftover or an earlier season goat that's already trained to walk and does pretty well, or if you show two species with both sheep and goats and you have a lamb that will walk really well, that's a luxury. So when you start training uh, the new goats to walk, they've got something to follow. They do much better if you can give them an opportunity to follow something. It's not always the case. You don't always have that. So it uh, certainly will work for you. It's just gonna be a little more work in terms of a little more effort from your part in terms of teaching them to walk. But we, it, to me, that was always a two person job. The, the showman on the, the chain or the halter and mom or dad or brother or sister behind the goat making a little noise, whether we're clapping behind them or whether we're just reaching down and, and tapping them below the tail, whatever we needed to do to keep them moving. So that was always a two person job for us in terms of when we take them out of the pen those first few times and we're teaching them to walk. We always fed numerous, more than one. So, you know, we had uh, an opportunity usually to have one that was the lead goat that, that enjoyed it, that did well, and you know I'm the oldest, so I took the lead goat and would walk because I didn't want to bend over as much as, as my son or daughter did. So I would take the lead goat or my wife would take the lead goat. She's much better at it than all of us. And we would get out and we would just have a, a procession of, of livestock and, and get out and teach them to walk. And if, if they, you've got something that they can follow, you'll be much, much better off. So train them to walk. That is so important, that's so critical in terms of showmanship, that when you hit that gate, that that goat will walk, whether you're the first one in or you're the middle of the pack or you're the last one in, that goat needs to come into the ring and feel comfortable and get to where he'll walk. We'll talk more about showmanship in our next session and some things that you need to do to help that. But we're, uh, from a training standpoint, it really is a, just a, a daily routine or at least a, you know, a few times a week routine where you're, embed, you're, you're teaching them that, that skill and they'll remember that and they learn to trust you and they'll walk for you. So walking's really important. 
once we get them to where they would walk, then we start working on, on setting legs. And you know, there's a couple of ways that we did that. This is a great tool, this, this uh, trim table. And this one, for instance, you can make the, the front a little higher than the back, or you can kick the back legs back and set it at an angle. Great tool. We use those a lot at our house to teach them. We'd set them in here. They, that teaches them to set their head up the way we want them to set. We'd set their front legs, set their back legs, get that same bucket set beside the table and just make them stand. So that's muscle memory. They, they begin to understand where you want their legs to be. When they move their leg, we'd reset it. When they move it, we'd reset it. So we're constantly keeping legs set and we're setting them. I'll show you when we get one on the table in a little while, but we're setting them in a pretty natural kind of a stance where we want to want them to be standing and, and stopping when we uh, have them in the show ring. You know, it's it, it gets to the point when you have these goats really well trained, once you're in the ring and you're walking, you make a circle for the judge and you stop profile, there's very little that you have to do. Those goats, that muscle memory will just kind of kick in and they'll stop with their feet and legs set close to where you want them. And then you just got minor adjustments to be able to, to set them and get them ready to show. When I'm judging, I talk, in, particularly in showmanship, I talk a lot about being quick and being efficient. And that when, when you uh, get out of a goat from a brace situation to take off and walk, and then when you stop before you reset, to me, those are the two times in the show ring that the goat looks their absolute worst because they've just relaxed, they've gotten easy in their top. So the quicker you can get them reset, the better. And that comes from training at home. If they, if they don't wanna set their legs for you, you're gonna have some, some difficulty and it's gonna take you a lot longer to get them set and get them looking the part. So we spend a lot of time doing that at home and kind of our daily routine as we were working was you know typically one goat at a time after my daughter graduated and we just had my son show him before that, they would each have a goat, but we would uh, send, uh, just tell them to walk, make a circle. We had a spot uh, marked out where they would make a pretty big circle, walk them around, they'd come back and I'd have them set, stop and set profile. And it was stop and set just as quick as they possibly can. Stop and set, stop and set. I'd come in and, and we'd handle them like a judge would to teach them that so that they're accustomed to somebody kind of, you know, poking on their top and touching them. They get comfortable with that. Then I'd back off and I'd make them go again and we'd walk and then we'd stop and set, walk, stop and set. We'd do that over and over again until it became uh, just second nature to those goats and they knew what to do. So that was, that was part of our daily routine in terms of training these goats and getting them to where they'll, uh, they'll show for you. All of that is great. And, and all of those are steps leading up to teaching them to brace. There's no sense in trying to teach one to brace until you've taught them to walk until they trust you completely, until you've taught them kind of where their feet and legs need to be set in terms of, of uh, when you stop. You, you've got to do all those things before you try to teach one to brace. And you know, as I mentioned, the very first thing you do is get them to give you their head. You're not going to get one to brace for you until they've given you their head. So all this leads up to teaching a goat to brace. And you know, there was a school of thought many years ago that we didn't brace goats. And there's still some states where you don't brace goats. I'm talking to primarily to Texas exhibitors today, and I'm talking primarily about Texas rules. So if you live in a state that doesn't allow bracing, th this part's not for you. This, this particular section of the training may not fit your rules. But in Texas, it is important that you teach them to brace. It's equally as important that you teach them to brace with all four feet on the ground. So uh, most judges don't want to come by and see the front feet this far up off the ground. The goat looks like he's jammed up. He's uh, looks easy in his top usually. They get steeper out their hip. They just don't look as good. So we want to teach them at home to brace with all four feet on the ground. We use this tool right here a whole lot, our blocking table. We had another table. We called it the bracing box. It's about four times as big as this, made of wood with, with green carpet, indoor-outdoor carpet on it. Those were the two tools that we used the most to teach goats to brace. And we put them up on that raised platform and get the showman up there with them and just ease them back until they start to step off and they'll brace back into you. Most of them, it doesn't take too long to teach them that. You're gonna run into that occasional goat that's hard headed, that is very, very difficult to teach and just know that you're gonna have to put more time in on those and, and uh, than the others. So, uh, but that's critical that you do that. And we would make sure that they would, uh, that they were comfortable bracing, that they would stand for three to five minutes without dancing a whole lot before we put them on the ground. So we'd get up on what we call the bracing box with 
the showman and the goat, and they would just stand there and brace and just practice doing that. Once they got really comfortable with it and the goat got comfortable, we'd go to the ground. If on the ground, if the goat decided, huh, I, there's nowhere to fall, I'm gonna try them, and he starts running backwards or doesn't wanna brace, right back to the bracing box. So we use that tool, we use that year long. It's a great training tool, but sometimes these goats relapse a little bit and they forget what you've taught them. So if that happens, go right back to the table, go right back to the box that you were using to teach them to brace, and let's get them up on there and, and uh, kind of retrain and make sure that they remember what we've taught them. So that was the daily training kinds of things that we did. And again, I'll, I'll, I'll say it again, what you teach them right now is absolutely critical, but you've got to continue to reinforce that year long. So I always use the saying with my, with my kids and with kids that I've worked with that if you've got a halter or you've got a chain on that goat and you've got your hand on them, you're teaching them something. Make sure what you're teaching them is the right thing. So if, you're, if you've got them on a chain, don't let them be out here running around at the end of the chain. Keep that chain up pretty tight. Make them stand close to you and make them keep the head up. So they know when this halter right here goes on them, it's showtime. And that's what they're expected to do. If you allow them to relax or to get out on the end of the chain and, and walk around or keep their head down, they're going to try to do that to you in the ring. They need to know that this means it's time to walk with our head up. It's time to keep our head up. It's time to stop and, and plant our feet where they need to be. They need to associate all of this when they've got a chain or they've got a halter on. They need to associate that with it being showtime. So that comes from reinforcement at home. We did not leave chains on our goats in the pen. So, you know, we, we kept our uh, chains close by. And when it came time to work, we'd get in the pen and, and chain, put the chain on the goat that we wanted to work with, take it back off, uh, you know, when we were through. And for us, it was more of a safety thing, just making sure that they didn't have something around their head that they could get hung uh, and, and choke or have some kind of problem during the day when we weren't there. So we didn't keep chains on them. And initially it was a safety thing, but, but I think it is important uh, from the standpoint of, of them knowing when that chain's on that it's time to go, it's time to show. There's a, a, another kind of chain that is a, a good tool to use at home. If you get one of those that's a little bit hard headed, these spike chains are, they're fine to use at home. These are not chains that you use in a show. They're, they're against most show rules. They're not, uh, it's not a, a really, really uh, uh, strict or, or constricting kind of a chain, but it does provide a little bit of extra pressure under the chin. So if you've got one of those that wants to be a little more stiff necked or wants to pull down against you, this can be a pretty good tool to help you break that and get them started at home. That's all we use these for from time to time. Then we, we went to the regular chain or the, or the show halter. Uh, so that, that's what worked for us. Get a lot of questions and we'll talk about this in showmanship more, but uh, you know, which one? Do you, use a, do you use a chain, do you use a halter? And I would say the answer to that is yes, really depends on the goat. Some goats do great in a chain, do much better in a chain than they do in a halter. Some goats do much better on a halter than they do in the chain. We never had a set of goats that we, that we showed 100% in a chain or 100% in a halter. We always had some of both. So that's what I would tell you, but we'll talk more about why when we get into the showmanship section next week. So I'm gonna throw a question at you uh, right quick and just ask you uh, how often, how many times per week do you need to practice with the goat and in terms of setting up and walking? How many times per week is ideal? Y'all type your answer into the chat and then I'll stop for a second and see if Dottie has questions. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Ripley. Um, certainly, I hope everybody will chime in. We have lots of folks watching with us. Um, and so um, I know that they're going to have some great insight here. It'll be interesting to see uh, for sure how much and how often folks work with their animals. We know that um, our youth livestock exhibitors, especially here in Texas, we're really proud of them for all of the hard work um, that they do with their livestock projects. So excited to see um, and hear what they have to say. Um, as you alluded to, we are going to have another session next week. That one's going to be on Thursday at 4 p.m. And we're going to be talking about showmanship. And we're going to have a real live showman uh, right there probably in, in Pierce Pavilion. And we're going to be talking through the ins and outs of showmanship. And, and you're going to be able to give us some inside 
um, knowledge and, and the scoop on not only some great tips, but also, you know, maybe what, what show judges are looking for and things to do and not to do and things like that. So certainly looking forward to that session. Um, as we, oh, folks are commenting. Some are saying every day, which is what I expected. Like I said, our youth livestock exhibitors are certainly um, hard workers. We have lots of every days, um, minimum of every other day. What do you think about that, Dr. Ripley? I think both, both of those are correct answers. There are some goats that you're going to have to work with every day, some that about every other day is plenty. And I think the longer you get into the show season, then the every other day probably becomes more applicable. Uh, you know, kind of in the mid middle part of the season. As we got ready to go to a show, I can tell you that, you know, our Houston, let's say we're getting ready to go to, to Fort Worth, our Houston goat might not be getting worked every day, but that Fort Worth, San Antonio, San Antonio or San Angelo goat, those were getting worked every day. So it kind of depends on the time, but early on, it's, it's all about being very consistent and teaching them as often as you can. So four to five times a week minimum and I, every day would be great, depending on how many you have and how much time you have. So those are both good answers, absolutely. So the other part that I'll talk just a little bit about, and, and this is uh, not grooming, it's not training, but it's, it's a part of our daily routine or our weekly routine was we weighed goats regularly and we charted growth and charted the way these goats were changing. It's kind of a part of the, it kind of fits it really into all the sessions that we've talked about, but we, we typically weighed goats on Sunday afternoons and uh, <clears throat> on, on every Sunday afternoon, we weighed everything we put them on the chart and we could kind of manage and see what was growing, what was gaining, what was changing. And, and that told us what we needed to do and what kind of adjustments we needed to make for that particular goat. If we needed to up the feet a little bit, if we needed to slow down a little bit, if it was time to go to the track and start exercising. So, uh, so weighing is, was a big part of what we did. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about, and we'll get a goat up here. Uh, we're going to talk a little about uh, hair and skin care. We're going to talk a little about uh, some of those things. You know, we've got goats that are uh, that are trained, that are uh, walking, that'll kind of set up and show for these young people. Now it's time that we're going to start doing a little more of the fine tuning in the work. This was not something that we did necessarily year long, unless we were going to some jackpots. Some of the goats that weren't going to jackpots, we wouldn't do this until later in the year is when we really started focusing on this. But uh, it's, it's critically important that we take care of that. So I'm gonna talk about some things that we did. I really appreci appreciate the Rutherford family bringing some goats to us today, and uh, coming and helping with this session. As you can see, we've got goats that uh, obviously have had some time spent with them. They're walking fairly well. Probably been on this table a time or two. So as I, as I was talking about these tables, you know, are a really, really good tool to help you teach these goats to do this right here. You can keep that head and neck coming up out of the top of the shoulder. I don't, you don't want to raise it up so much that it's uncomfortable, but you want to raise it up enough and neck is coming where we want it to be that they don't have so much slack that they can turn and fight that they'll just kind of start settling in there. And then you as a showman, can begin to work these legs to make them stand the way you want them to stand. It helps when you tighten the, the head stanchion enough that it doesn't fall. Come in and set these legs. And this is what I was talking about that we would do. We actually have a, a rack on the ground that holds forehead. And we use that probably more later on in, in uh, uh, our careers than we did one of these because we could do four at a time. We had several goats. So we put all four on a rack and we, Everything that we're going to talk about from here on, the rack was a great tool for us, but but so is uh, this table. Works really, really well. So we'd put them on, we'd teach them to do this, and and just get them to where they're comfortable. When you set them on the ground, they'll be much more apt to stop and, and be in this kind of a position with the back legs where we want them, with the front legs where we want them. They when they're comfortable, tails more likely to be up the way we'd like for it to be all these things start to flow together. So that this table is a great tool for doing that. Now, talk a little bit about hair and skin care. <clears throat> you know, there's a, there's a train of thought that, well, what does it matter? We're just gonna cut it all off, right? Why, why do we wanna grow hair? We're not gonna keep it, we're gonna shear it. 
but what's under that hair is skin and an indicator of healthy skin is healthy hair. So to us, it was always critical, absolutely critical to take good care of the skin and hair. The first time that I judged a, a major livestock show, one of the big ones, you know, there was a, there was a, a county there that, that was exhibiting goats at a really high level. And I, I knew their county agent. I didn't know where any of these kids were from, but until they started announcing and, and a common denominator started to come up. And the, the thing that those goats had from that particular county, they weren't always the best goats, but they always were the freshest handling, freshest feeling goats that I touched all day long. And this was many, many years ago. I visited with their county agent and said, what are y'all doing? And we talked about their hair care program. And I can tell you as a judge, it made that much difference in my mind that I wanted to find out and ask a question about hair care, daily hair care they were doing. As a, as a parent, I wanted to adopt some of those. And I've changed some things over the years in terms of what we did, but a lot of his, uh, a lot of those, uh, that particular county's basic uh, principles in hair care have stuck with me for uh, 20 years in terms of, of what we do. Like I said, we use the, uh, the rack or the table, whichever one's more comfortable. We put in it, and the first thing we always did was we wanted to, to blow that hair out and just get them clean, get the dirt and sand out of their hair. We always blew, blow hair from front to back. So when you're working these goats, you're going to blow from the, the head to the tail and get the hair to lay backwards. And all we're trying to do on this first initial blow is just get the dirt out, just kind of get them clean. Blown out good, get them clean. Once we've gone over them, kind of got them clean, there's two things that, well, there, you know, skin problems, skin irritations, uh, dry skin can cause you problems. Another thing that can cause you huge problems with freshness and handle and skin quality is lice. And, and goats will get lice uh, free times a year. So in addition to, you know, your warming protocol, which can help with some of that, we, uh, we sprayed those goats and we did this at least two or three times a week. See, this one's so trained, he wasn't chained in and he didn't even leave. Look at that. We tried to, to do this two or three times a week early on. <clears throat> We'd put them in the rack, take just a, just a simple kind of a fly spray. And just mist them down with that fly spray. Let that set for just a minute. We'd kind of brush it in, get it to the skin. You know, it does a couple of things for you. It, there's a little bit of residual here that'll help in terms of flies bothering them. So, you know, the actual purpose of it, it's just a, a very mild uh, permethrin type product. It also does a great job on just getting those, keeping those lice off of the goats if you happen to have any. So we'd spray a little fly spray on them, make sure that we're keeping them clean and free of lice, absolutely important. There's some other products that you can use. You can talk to your vet and talk to your feed store owner about things that you can use for lice. Critically important that you keep lice off these goats. So we put that on there, do the same thing with our blower. We just come in and make sure that we're getting that to the skin. So I'm going at a little bit of an angle, blowing front to back, getting that fly spray work towards the skin this off of them. And then our third step in the process was you know, some, some sort of a, a conditioner spray. And that is exactly what we talked about, just keeping moisture in the skin keeping the skin healthy. And we would take, you know, whatever, whatever you choose to use, some sort of conditioner. We usually used a mane and tail or a conditioner like that. 
and I would put about uh, four ounces, four to six ounces in a 32 ounce bottle in the bottom of the bottle, mix water with it, shake it up good, and then just come in and mist them. And we've missed them pretty heavy with, uh, with the main and tail spray. Not till they're dripping wet, but till they've, they're pretty damp. And again, we brush that in. I always use a soft brush. Uh, there's lots of different kinds of brushes. All of them work well. I use a soft Get it working towards the. And I, we like to let that set for just a couple of minutes. And then we would do the same process, process with the blower. So really there were at three times, every time we work with them, there were three times that we were blowing that hair. That really helps train that hair to lay this way. Then when you shear them, yes, we're gonna shear it all off. But when you shear them, that hair is trained to, to lay flat and to lay smooth. They're going to handle so much pressure and so much softer if you'll do these sorts of things. That didn't have anything to do with what we're doing from here down. We'll talk about that next. This is, this is training the body hair. This is what we're trying to do. So then we come and, and do the same, same process with the blower, a little bit of an angle, lay the hair back, blow the, the conditioner into the skin. We're not trying to get them completely dry, but they're going to be fairly dry by the time we get through with this. So you can see the length of time that took and that was pretty standard three or four minutes per per goat and if you've got four on the table that speeds that up a little bit because you can go through blow four uh, do your your uh, fly spray to all four blow them again do your conditioner to all four and blow them again so you can you can do the whole thing in 10 minutes or so if you've got a multi-head uh, kind of, of stanchion that you can use that was our standard we did that two or three times a week uh, we tried to do it two or three times a week to these goats just to get that hair and to keep that hair and skin healthy. If you get lice on these goats, the, the damage that does to the hair, uh, they, they just, I used to call it possum hair. They feel like a possum. They, they get wire haired. They don't feel fresh. It makes a big difference. A really good goat will not have that freshness and that fresh touch. And you hear judges talk about that in shows as maybe what separate first and third. You know, two, three really good goats. The one and third was the one that didn't handle as fresh. That could be part of the problem was how hair and skin. So uh, this is, you know, it's hard to say it's uh, uh, critically important to take great, <clears throat> great care of hair that we're fixing to cut off, but it's critically important to take great care of hair that you're fixing to cut off. I, it's one of those things you just need to invest the time in uh, to be able to do if you want to compete at a high level. The skin and hair, or the, the hair from the, the hocks, knees and hocks is what, uh, you know, you'll, you'll see a, a lot of people talk about foot size and bone size. Has nothing to do with foot size or bone size, but it does have, can help you create an illusion of more bone and more foot size if you can grow this hair and train it to lay right. And that's really what we're trying to do. This, you know, what you'd like for these goats to, to become uh, accustomed to or this hair to become accustomed to is to kind of part in the middle some of the hair goes forward some of the hair goes backwards so that you have the appearance from the side that this distance from the back of his leg to the front of his leg is farther you want more distance there and what you're doing with that hair is just creating the look of, of having just a little more stoutness of bone down the center you want this hair to kind of stand up now as I mentioned earlier, we're, we're going to talk today about showing in Texas. In Texas, you have to do that naturally. You can't use adhesives. You can't use products uh, to, to like, you know, the, some of the steer shows where you can make that hair stand out. Spray type products you cannot do that in Texas. It's illegal to use products at the show to make that happen. So you're going to have to train that hair to do that for you. And then before you go in, you can brush it and hopefully 
uh, it'll it'll retain uh, the training that you've you've done with it at home. So you know we don't we didn't wash goats a whole lot, but we did rinse from the knees and hocks down pretty regularly. Just clean water. We rinse that, and then blow those legs and and continue to blow those legs out in an attempt to grow more hair. When we're blowing legs. We blow, we would blow right down the middle of that leg so that you're training the front part of that hair to lay forward, the back part of that layer, to, that hair to go back. And then you have to slide upward angle to your blower nozzle because you want that hair to stand up. That's what you're trying to do is create the illusion of a little more circumference of bone. So we would do that sometimes as we work skin and hair. We'd rinse those legs and blow them to do that. Another tool that we used some on legs was, was a, a, a rotary brush. You could take that rotary brush and work that leg hair with that rotary brush, just trying to get that leg hair accustomed to standing up. I think my hands don't work as fast as this uh, drill, so this saved us a lot of time. We get, go through and, and get some significant brushing done on these legs. With this rotary, uh, with this rotary brush, a whole lot more than we could with a hand brush. So those are some of the things that we did in terms of, of feet and legs, or in terms of leg hair, and in terms of body hair, and trying to keep them fresh and give them just that little bit of extra edge when they go in the show ring. They're going to look fresher. They're going to have a better uh, tone and and a look to their hair. And certainly, when the judge comes up and handles them, they're going to have a much fresher feel if you'll do that sort of thing. Take some time, but we always felt like it was time well spent. We couldn't always buy the best one. We couldn't always afford uh, to buy the best one, but we weren't going to get beat. That was our goal, was not to get beat, beat by uh, a goat that, that maybe wasn't quite as good as us, but that was uh, much more uh, fresh in terms of his handle. What we wanted to do was maybe beat a few of those goats that probably uh, had a better start than we did, but we, we put in a little extra work at home and we're able to get ahead of them. We got some questions, Dottie? Yeah, you bet, Dr. Ripley. I, I real quick want to say just thank you for that, that overview and all the tips that you shared. I think it's also really a testament to how hard our young people are working and really just the level of care that you put into to these livestock projects, just the intricate details that sometimes get lost in the shuffle but are so important as we speak to um, the level of care and commitment that our young people have to their livestock projects. Um, right. Real quickly, can you um, elaborate you, you mentioned that you don't wash goats too often, but can you can you elaborate on how often do you wash it more specifically and um, how often you're doing the leg uh, hair training? Sure, sure. So uh, I'll be honest, as far as washing, we wash goats typically that we were taking to a show, not always, but typically we'd wash them if we were taking them to a show. Other than that, they didn't get washed at home. So. You know, you'll hear people talk about bathing goats weekly, and, and I know there are people that do things different. To me, a big part of the skin and hair quality is them maintaining and retaining their natural oils. And every time you wash them with a soap of any kind, even if it's a gentle livestock soap, you're going to remove those natural oils that are in their hair and skin. Anytime you remove those natural oils in their hair and skin, you dry it out. So somehow you've got to put that back. And to me, nothing is as good, you know, in terms of putting oil back in them, but nothing's as good as Mother Nature in terms of taking care of that, that natural oil. So we did not wash them very often. Sometimes if we were just going to jackpot shows and they'd had a blanket on and they were pretty clean and I could blow them and, and shear them and they looked clean, we might only wash the legs. We might not wash the body. We'd try to leave that goat uh, as, as much of that skin and hair alone as we could, as much of that oil alone in their hair as we could. They almost always got washed before we went to a major. They would get rinsed at a major just to freshen them up or make them feel a little better. You know, they're in a, a crowded barn. Sometimes it's dusty. So we would do that at, at major shows. But typically jackpot shows, they didn't get washed before we went. We always washed from the down to get those legs really, really clean. And, you know, we kept blankets on them a lot at home. So the, the majority of their body was covered and they didn't get very dirty. Feet and legs or their legs were going to get dirty. So those got washed routinely. 
the the training on that leg hair we did that at the same time as we do the rest of the uh the training of, of hair on the body so three four times a week as we got a little bit further along in the year there were some goats that uh, needed a little special care that maybe didn't have quite as much leg hair they might get worked every day and and oftentimes you know that was a a big part of what Colton could do, uh, you know, when he got home from school or got home from work was he'd run down there and work some uh, some leg hair on those goats and have all that done before I got home and we'd start doing some of the other things. So uh, times a week, some of them got it every day. Excellent. Thanks, Dr. Ripley. We actually just had a really good question come in, especially as we're talking about how important it is to keep that hair and, and skin fresh. And that's, do you leave blankets on year round in the pen? A little bit differently. Our sheep, once they went to their show and got uh, washed and sheared, they got a blanket put on them and it was kind of a quarter nylon style blanket. That blanket never came off again. It would come off while we worked them. It would come off uh, to get washed and put back on them, but they kept blankets on uh, all the time, year round. Goats, once they once through a little bit of hair, we some if the weather was warm, we sometimes would take the blankets off of them and let them not have a blanket on them all the time. And uh, I, those of you that feed both species, you know, I know there's different schools of thought. Goats are just more curious and destructive, and we just found that. You know, if you left blankets on them year long, you're gonna throw a lot of blankets away and replace a lot of blankets. If it's cold, they're, they've got a blanket. If their uh, hair is really, really short for you know the first two or three weeks after a show, they've got a blanket. If the weather's pretty nice uh, and, and they've got a little bit of hair on them, we, we would not always blanket them. When it gets to about 45, 48 degrees, somewhere in there, they got a got down into the 30s they get two blankets so we would we'd put two blankets on them goats do not like cold weather in general and they sure don't like cold and wet so uh the the weather would indicate to us a lot of times what we did kind of our answer we didn't always have blankets on them but they had blankets on more days than they didn't if that makes sense of course. Thanks, Dr. Ripley. Our next question might be a great segue into um, what I think we're going to next, just based off of what I see behind you. The question is, how often do you clip the goats? Right. So that is where we're going next. So I will tell you that the one thing that you'll figure out the longer you feed goats is when you shear a goat, you're going to change their growth pattern a little bit. They're going to go through, as soon as you shear them the first time, they're going to go through a little growth spurt. After that, they're going to grow a little more. So we have we have had some goats uh, down through the years that were smaller frame goats that we knew were going to be lightweight goats, and, and that's where they needed to be. They didn't get sheared any. We've had a couple of goats that the first time I ever put clippers on going to a major stock show. We've had goats that we hauled to a lot of jackpots. They got sheared pretty often because we were going to shows with them fairly often. So it really depends on the goat. I, there was not a, a rule of thumb that said we're going to shear goats every six weeks. We didn't have anything like that. In general, we you know we tried to show these goats at least in in a you know some sort of a jackpot or a clinic or something at least two or three or four times before they went to a major show. So they were going to be sheared at least that many times between you know about this time of year and March. So we there we would make sure that everyone generally got sheared two or three times at least. Uh, you know, to me, again, the more time, the more more you're exposing their skin uh, to to drying out, the more you're exposing them to the sun, the more you're you have opportunities for that hair to dry and to get uh, less fresh. So we didn't shear all the time. We sheared before we went to shows, and then you know it, was, it takes a lot of effort when you've done that to put in them as you possibly can, as you as you possibly can. So for us. It was really only as we were getting ready to go to shows was typically when these goats got sheared. If they if if it was one that we weren't going to take to a jackpot and he was not going to leave the house, he might get sheared a time or two through the season just so we can. So let's talk a little bit about shearing. Um, I will say that 99% of the time we sheared with cover coats. That's, uh, you know, there's 
Uh, there's a couple of different brands that, that call them different things, but it's cover code, it's extra cover, typically is what you'll see these blades called. They leave about a quarter of an inch, between a quarter and three eighths of an inch of hair is what they will leave. So they're not taking it to the skin. They're leaving just a little bit of that hair. That's really important. A lot of these goats will have a little freckle to their skin. Uh, they might uh, you know, be goats that just look right if you peel, peel them all the way down to the skin. If you can leave just a little bit of hair, they're gonna handle fresher, they're gonna look fresher. So that was our, our blade of choice always was the cover coat blade. And shearing goats really is not rocket science. Your goal is to, to get everything off from the, the hocks and the knees up. Everything else comes off. There are some tricky spots in shearing these goats, you know, between these back legs, under these front legs, around the belly can be tricky and then the heads uh there's nobody that enjoys shearing the head on a goat i don't if somebody says they do i'd like to hire them because they're just not fun shearing heads on goats are going to fight you. and then the other spot that you want to be careful is the tail you want to to make sure that you don't take all that switch all that end of the tail hair off you want to leave a little of that on and and uh, make sure that they look the part so i'll shear a little bit of this goat and kind of show you what we do our, you know, we've, we've trained that hair to lay from the front to the back. Now, when we shear him, I typically shear from the front to the back, from the back to the front, go against that hair, and you'll, you'll get a much smoother job if, if, as you start to shear. So I always start with the tail. And I like to get the tail done and get that out of the way before we start doing it. These are short strokes that I'm making around this tail. The whole goal here is to get this clean, get this done, and then we can move on and shear the goat. But I like to get this knocked out around this tail. And these are some of the tricky spots. You have to come at this from a little bit different angle sometimes and kind of hold that tail up. Because you want to make sure that you get all this tail, all this hair off. When he walks in the ring and that tail's up, you want this to look smooth when you, when you study him from behind. I said we want to leave a little bit of this hair on the tail. I sure do. I, you'll see some that bob them completely, and that's okay. I like to do this to, to start about two inches in from the end of this tail, get that all smooth, and then the hair that's remaining, I'm just going to kind of blend, kind of give it that paintbrush look. He's got a little curl at the end of his tail, and that's all right. That's how I like to, to do the tails, is to have a tail look about like that. The Rutherfords are gonna take this goat to a show in a week or two. I didn't take more off than they will. If they like, if they like it shorter, they can cut it a little bit shorter, but you can't put it back. So I like to leave a little bit of hair there so that you have that look. Once I get the tail done, then it's long, smooth strokes back to front. Again, these are cover coat blades. So you can, you're leaving, you see, you're leaving that three eighths of an inch of hair or so on this goat. And you'll find, you know, you can get, you can get most of the hair off and get them pretty smooth with one pass. But you're gonna have to go back over these goats a couple of different directions to really, really get them smooth. They're just like people. They'll have a little bit of a cowlick or they'll have a swirl. Uh, from time to time, but you have to, to shear just a little bit differently. You notice this right here at the where the hot makes that turn when I'm when I'm standing off and just shear, and that's where I'm going to start. I'm not going to go below that at all. We'll come back later and smooth that up clean that in. But as I'm making these long motions, I'm going to start at that hop, work my way up the leg in an upward motion, 
and then come back and make that long motion from front to back. If you're going to have lines, which always be a few lines in these goats, if you're going to have lines, you want them to be from front to back. You want the long lines rather than these lines coming up and down. That'll give you the appearance of being maybe just a little longer body. So other than some basic touch-up, the majority of his body on one side is done. You can see a little line there. You come back over it with these clippers. And then by the time you brush him, that line will be gone. The front part of this goat, obviously you are not going front to back. We're gonna to have to, to work that up. So I'll start at the knee and I want long strokes all the way up his shoulder and his neck. And then we'll, we'll tie those lines here. Make sure those lines are, are blended in. You can get the majority of that without ever moving their front leg get the majority of this cleaned up. One of the tricky spots that we talked about, it's a little bit hard to get in there and oftentimes you'll see uh, a goat, when he takes a step, you'll see that hair stick out. And that's probably because whoever was shearing got in a little bit of a hurry, didn't clean that up. It's not a, a killer in the show ring, but it just shows that we, we didn't pay quite as much attention to detail. So I like to pick the front leg up and come in under, make sure we've got that breast plate really clean. And then pull that front leg forward and shear up towards this shoulder pocket. They don't like it. Okay, so we're going to get all that from in the back part of the shoulder pocket from that angle. Then we'll pick the leg up and get the front part of the shoulder pocket from this angle. You can also come back up the inside of that leg while you've got it in the air and make sure that you've got all that cleaned out. that almost always has to be done in a different direction is right here in front where that shoulder lays into his chest. That hair always lays this way. We've come and sheared from this direction primarily and that hair's laying this way. So you've almost always got to come in and just get that last little bit of hair cleaned up in his front end by going a slightly different direction. So the other area that I mentioned that can be a little tricky is under these back legs. And again, you'll see goats walking away and as they get away, you can see hair hanging down there. The rules say that you're gonna have corn from the knees up. One of the things that you'll see people occasionally do is intentionally leave some hair under, under here to make them look a little deeper sided. Most of the time that's an accident, but Show officials may not know whether that was an accident or whether it was intentional. You don't want to take a chance. So you've got to get pretty comfortable with being able to put these back legs up and shear that belly really good. And, and this uh, right here in this twist, they'll get some hair there, they'll get some hair, uh, you know, right here in front of those back legs. Sides, pick the back legs up and make sure that I've got that good and clean. 
I really haven't sheared his belly yet. And this is another area where you'll find if you have to go different directions, the way that hair is laying here, you've got to come back and go from uh, front to back to clean that off. Be careful around his teeth. Make the inside of these legs and make sure you've got all that really cleaned up. And then I always go back over them one more time. Pretty good from front to back. Just smooth them up. Get as many of those lines out as you possibly can. And get them smoothed up that way. So you've got about a half a goat done. It's not a, it's not a process that takes hours. I probably would be a little slower if we were getting ready to go to San Antonio or Houston or uh, Rodeo Austin or somewhere, but uh, you know, Getting ready to go to a jackpot, we could we could knock one out fairly quickly in terms of uh, getting them sheared and ready to go. That's the general process of, of how we sheared one. That's got one side of them done, and uh, you can see the uh, the difference it makes. This goat's got really really good skin and hair. This goat's got, and you know when we sheared him, you can really start to see the shape and and the uh, definition that he offers in terms of his muscle. There's a a benefit uh, to, to doing that and being able to see these goats uh, from that standpoint. So Dottie, let me stop again and see if we got questions. Yeah, thanks Dr. Ripley. Goats starting to look pretty good there. Um, I can tell that it's certainly well taken care of like you mentioned. Um, speaking of shearing them to go to a show, we have a question of how many days before the show do you shear them? Excellent. My, my rule of thumb was always at the last minute possible. So, you know, morning and, and the, uh, the county's getting together and we were going to leave it at six o'clock on a Tuesday morning. We're sharing Monday evening late. Uh, if we're leaving on a Wednesday morning, Tuesday evening late. I like to shear as close as you possibly can to the time that you're going to show them. If we're just going to a jackpot somewhere uh, on a Saturday, we were shearing on, on Friday night. That was our rule of thumb. I like to get them sheared just as, as close as possible to the show date. Some, sometimes that's three or four days before the show. Sometimes it's the day of the show, depending on where you're going. But uh, there's, you know, that was always our possibly could to the show. Excellent. Thanks for that. We have another question of what brand and style of clippers do you recommend? You know, there's a lot of good ones. Uh, most people use either listers or premieres, I would say. Uh, the, the key is that, you know, you're using this kind of blade, this flat blade uh, that's, that leaves that three eighths of an inch of hair. So, you know, the, the sheep shears, the old style sheep shears, this doesn't work, okay? This is not what we use on a goat. These are great for the things that they're designed for, but this is all you need for a goat. The Lister, the Premier, uh, something like that, that's got the flat hair blade that you can can get in that three eighths inch cover coat or extra cover. Excellent, thanks, Dr. Ripley. Um, kind of shifting from the shearing, I'd like to to get your insight on the products you're using after. You know, we talk about how important it is to keep that skin and hair good. I'm sure that after you pull that hair off, you're putting something back on, perhaps. Can you speak a little to that and then also elaborate on the differences between the products that you're using, you know, at home in training or right after you get done shearing or clipping and how those may differ or how they should differ from the products that you are allowed to use at major livestock shows in Texas? Great question, Dottie. Great question. So when we finish shearing, you know, and we're not finished yet, so I don't want to soak him down again. But when we finish shearing, the same product that we use uh, weekly and, and, you know, several times a week, just our conditioner and water is typically what we put back on them. We spray them down with that conditioner and water. We brush them in. 
and they get a blanket immediately. We're probably gonna do that uh, you know, numerous times. The, the conditioner um, uh, that's watered down, just the, the diluted uh, solution, we're gonna do that numerous times. We're gonna spray it on them, put a blanket on them. We'll do it again later that day. We'll do it in the morning before we put them on the trailer to, to go to the show. And then once we get to the show, they're getting that conditioner uh, pretty frequently. There's a lot of different ones. You can use the aerosol, uh, the freshen up kind of products, the aerosol products. We used a lot more of just the, uh, the conditioner mixed with water was primarily what we used. Now, going into the show ring, a lot of major shows, and you need to understand what the rules say at major shows, a lot of major shows say no grooming products allowed. This is a grooming product, okay? So can you use it, you know, a day or two before? Yeah, you're going to clean them up. You're going to rinse them. Those goats aren't going to have anything on them. But are you supposed to use that going into the show ring? You're not. So, you know, you may use a waterless shampoo at the show. One of the, uh, the we, we always called it the blue shampoo, the waterless shampoo. You can use that to clean them up at the show if you need to. And that kind of pops that hair a little bit. Other than that, you're not supposed to put anything on them but water at a show. And that's just to freshen them up. So know what the rules say. If you're going to a jackpot show over the weekend or, you know, something like that, those kinds of shows are much more lax. And, you know, using a, a conditioner or a freshen up as you go into the ring is perfectly acceptable. They don't have rules against that. So that's not a problem. But you need to understand what the rules are at a show that you're going to and make sure that you're not getting outside of those rules and getting into something that's going to make a really good goat get in a situation where you don't get to show them. So be very, very careful with what you use. You can't use anything to change the color pattern of a goat. So you see a lot of people using baby powder. What do we use baby powder for? We use baby powder to change the color pattern. It makes them brighter and whiter and they look better, right? Again, if you're going to a jackpot show, it's probably okay. If you're at a major show, it's probably not. And I've judged shows all over the country. And you know, there's some shows when you walk up and you handle it comes up. It's legal at those shows, they can do that. When you look down at their legs, they're finned out and, and boned up and glued and painted and, and they've got uh, all kinds of, of twine and things added to their leg, it's legal, they can do that. If you're showing in Texas, none of that is legal. You can't do any of that. So and make sure that you're following those rules in terms of products that you can use and you don't wanna get yourself in trouble. Take good care of skin and hair at home. Make sure that you've got them fresh and healthy and you really don't need those other things. The rest of it will fall in place for you. Excellent. Thanks, Dr. Ripley. We have a lot of good questions still coming in. So even though we are a little past the one o'clock hour, I'm going to keep going because these folks are interested and they have some really great questions. But I do want to touch on one more thing sure. related to products while we're still on that subject. And that has to do with keeping that tail up. We know that when they, a goat comes prancing in with its tail up and, and, and keeps it up, it looks you know at its best. And we can all agree on that. However, um, we know that there are some products that are used um, to, to help with that um, that may not be allowed. Can you elaborate on that? Absolutely. So, uh, you know, you, you need to read the rules as, as exhibitors and, and know what they say. But in general, what they say is that you're not allowed to apply anything internally or externally to the rectum area of a goat, period. So does that mean you can spray something that's got a little bit of irritant? like that and make his tail stand up, You're not supposed to do that, okay? That's what the rules say. Does that mean you can take a little bit of, of alcohol or something like that and go just inside the rectum? Absolutely not, highly, highly illegal. So goats are either go, uh, genetically uh, inclined to keep their tail up or they're not. Uh, good judges, it doesn't make that much difference, honestly. Uh, a good judge is going to, to be able to see the goat whether it's tails up or down. <clears throat> yes, they look a little better on the move when their tails up. They look a little leveler out their hip when their tails up. A lot of that, when you see those that have that tail sucked down really hard, a lot of that is because that goat is uncomfortable. He's scared. He's nervous. So the more that we've worked with them, the more that we've hauled them to a show here and there, the more that we've prepared them for this moment in that show ring, the better chance you've got that they'll hold that tail up. There's really nothing that you can 100% uh, say is legal that you can use to try to pop that tail. And I will tell you in Texas, 
at the major shows, that is something that is watched and checked very carefully as goats come into the ring. And if, if there's suspicion that a goat has, uh, has had something applied uh, rectally to try to get that tail up, that will get exhibitors in trouble. And sometimes it's just that they didn't know. So please, please, please read and know what the rules are related to that particular issue. Excellent. Thanks for expanding on that, Dr. Ripley. We have a question come in that has to do with a goat right at this stage we're at. We've just sheared it, um, got that hair off. Now, can you give us any tips on preventing or treating a sunburn if it happens? Yeah, absolutely. So it's just no different than, than you and I. You do not want to see my stomach. It's white, okay? So the way I prevent a sunburn, I don't take my shirt off, right? So when, when I've removed everything off of this goat and I've exposed his skin, he's going to get a blanket. This is a, a lightweight, cool blanket that's going to make this goat comfortable. But he's not going to get too hot in this blanket. He's going to have a fan on him in the barn, but he will not sunburn through this blanket. So we're going we're gonna to make sure that he's, that he's uh, conditioned, that we put some moisture back in his hide. We're going to put this blanket on him. It's not coming off again until he's got this much hair again so that he won't sunburn because sunburn on these goats you see those that are a little bit crusty wrinkle up they get a, a rough feel to their skin that's because we've allowed them to have too much contact with the sun so that's a critical critical question that blanket goes on we're going to keep them cool with fans uh, but that blanket's not coming off again until they have about as much hair as this one had to start with excellent question as far as sunscreen products do not use them, period, okay? Do not use them. If you look on the ingredient label of a lot of our sunscreen products, they've got some painkiller type products in them. Uh, if you do get one with a little sunburn, don't use a solar cane or anything like that. Those have got a pain reliever type product in them. Those things will, will stay in their system and could cause you difficulties down the road. So just stay away from all that. Prevent it by keeping, a, keeping their blanket on them, just like I keep a shirt on, okay? Excellent. Did Thanks. I create an Did I disturb you with the image of me without a shirt? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So let's move along. Uh, kind of moving down the goat. Um, you already have it on the table. What better time to trim its hooves? Can you talk a little bit about trimming hooves, the process for that, and then how often you, you do that? Absolutely. I'm glad you mentioned that. That's the last thing we were going to talk about. Hoof trimming. You know, we, we talked in the selection process about making sure that you buy goats that are structurally sound. You cannot fix one that's, this is the pastern, this area right here. Those goats that are really, really weak pastern where their new claw is almost on the ground, the best hoof trimmer in the world can't fix that, okay? So buy them so that they're, they're structurally correct. You can make them worse by not tending to their feet. So we trim feet at least once a month and typically more often than that. You know, we kind of, and we're here at the middle of the month almost. This goat's feet were trimmed right at the beginning of the month. They are really, really good. He doesn't have a whole lot. But our goal always is to get these, these hooves flat, this, this area of the hoof from front to back. You just want it to be flat. This is a real good indicator. You can use your, you can lay the blade of your hoof trimmer and just look and see where we are. Most of the time, where you're going to take most off is up here on the toe. And you're just going to clean that toe up. When you've got goats like this that don't have much hoof, you don't need to take much off. It's, it's a pretty simple process. You're not gonna take much, but you're gonna just clean that, that toe up just a little bit. Make sure that we're good and flat. Put the two together. See if we're flat across, which we are. We're flat from front to back. If you need to take a little off the heel, you can do that as well. Again, this one's been, been clipped really, uh, uh, really recently, but he's, uh, he's got really good feet. Same on the back. We're gonna take more off the toe typically on the back. We wanna keep them up on their toes. Again, we want them to, to have the appearance of being pretty, st pretty straight and pretty stout through their pasterns. So we're gonna take more off the toe. And I'll tell you, it doesn't matter how many times you, sh you clip a goat's feet, they never like it. Never get to where they like it. They're gonna fight you just a little bit. Just a little off the toe. 
and you can stand back and look and make sure that, that they're pretty flat. And if you, you know, you see a high spot, you can get them back up and, and see what's going on with their feet and take a high spot out if you need to. He has a little bit of a high spot in the center of his hoof. Easy, buddy. And we do that typically once a month. A lot of people do it on the table. I really prefer to trim hooves on the ground. So what we typically would do was, uh, you know, I have somebody on the head of the goat, somebody that's going to show them, uh, you know, that's uh, got a hold of the head. Then I can get over the back of the goat, straddle him, and I can take this back leg up and come backwards. And he's much less when I do that. So when he's on the ground. So that's the way I, I prefer to clip, uh, trim hooves is on the ground. And I can take front legs and come backwards and come up and clean them here. So uh, once a month, not again, if they're good in terms of their pasterns and their structure, really all you're doing is just taking the length off the growth. You're keeping them flat from the, the heel to the toe and you're keeping them so that they, uh, so that they stand when they stop and stand that they're flat on the ground. There's not a whole lot to it. If you need corrective hoof trimming, uh, you know, that may be something that you need to, to seek a little help that are really, really good at using uh, a razor knife and, and a, a hoof plane and some of those kinds of things that can help you if you've gone too far. You may want to check with your county agent or ag teacher and see if they can help you with that or know somebody that can uh, if, if you've let it go too far. But if you'll stay on it, it's not a, it's not a huge uh, problem. Or it won't become a huge problem for you. Great. Thanks, Dr. Ripley. Um, you did discuss in great detail about, you know, maintaining and, and growing hair on the legs. One of our listeners brought up a really good point, and that's the front knees. So we know that goats typically, uh, you know, will lay on them and things like that and rub the hair off. Do you have any tips for um, maintaining that hair on the front knees and kind of maintaining or balancing that brown stain that could be up there? Sure. They're not going to have, typically, they're not going to have a lot of hair on their front knee. What you're going to try to do is to blend that so it's not so obvious. So, you know, as you get in the front of the goat, start just above that knee and make sure that you're slick. And then you can take the clippers and work down to blend it just to make sure as you come down the front of that knee that you just blend that hair in a little better so that you don't have a big puff of hair here, a bald spot here, and a big puff of hair below. So the key is to, to shear down to that knee and then just to blend from there down so that that, that bald spot, which 99% of them are going to have a little bit of a bald spot on their knee. You just want to blend it in so that it's not so obvious. You're not necessarily trying to grow a bunch of hair on his knee. Uh, some just won't do it. So you're, you're just going to try to blend and live with what you have on that front knee. Excellent. Thanks, Dr. Ripley. Um, that's about all the, the questions I'm seeing coming in, but goodness gracious, I want to thank everybody um, for watching with us and sticking with us. We've we've learned a whole bunch. We've gone through a little technical difficulty, got disconnected, talked about white bellies and sunburns, and, and we've covered some ground today. And so I want to thank everybody for sticking with us and certainly submitting some really great questions. Um, I'll let any last minute ones come in if you want to give us some, some you know, concluding thoughts and then uh, we'll wrap up our time together for today. Absolutely. Thanks, Dottie. And I'm glad I could put a visual in your mind that'll bother you all weekend. So I'm uh, glad I was able to do that for you. It's been a pleasure, an opportunity to visit today about, uh, you know, things that you can do. This is things that, uh, the things that we've talked about, anybody can do these things. You don't have to have the best goat. You don't have to have the biggest bank account. These are things where you can make a difference regardless of what you start with. You can make hard work, elbow grease, some time invested at home can make a, a, a nice goat really good, can make a really good goat great. You can't make a bad one great, but you can improve what you have. And that's something that every single one of you can do if you'll take the time uh, to pay attention, to invest, and to spend a little bit of time with your goat. You'll outshow, you'll outfit, you'll outgroom uh, some of the better ones out there. And you'll see over time, you move up consistently from uh, the middle of the class towards the top of the class, if you'll do those sorts of things. So again, glad to answer questions. Uh, anybody can call or email me at any time. Be glad to 
to visit with anybody about this. Good luck with your projects this fall. If you're going to State Fair or Heart of Texas or you've got a fall county fair, or if you're getting ready to go into the spring majors, you've got a lot of time to get them ready.